You're watching Car Babble. I'm Ewan. I'm sitting inside the BMW iX3 M Sport Pro electric midsize SUV from BMW. And I don't often say this about BMWs, but in this particular spec, I think they're really spoiling us. So if you want to find out why, buckle up and let's get into it. So this car is based on the original BMW X3 platform, which was an internal combustion engine car, which you can still get, but they then wanted to make an electric version of it. And so this is what this is. And from the outside though, you really need a keen eye to know the difference. There's really not many differences, to be honest. Blue bits around a lot of the badges and the grill's different. Other than that, there's really not much else to differentiate the two. So that's not a bad thing though. I think it was a pretty handsome looking mid-size SUV and I think it's really well proportioned but it's also high riding so it feels like a proper SUV and not one of these cars on stilts but it does have a lot of competitors so the, some of the competitors for this car include the Mercedes EQC and the Audi e-tron, the Tesla Model Y, the Jaguar I-Pace, maybe a Skoda Enyaq, um, you could maybe see a Kia EV6, a Hyundai Onix 5, although they're slightly smaller and more cars on stiltsy. This one does feel more like an actual SUV and I think that's an important point because if you really want an SUV and it's electric, well, technically the market's smaller in reality than ones that are actually called SUVs in my opinion. But this car, even with all the toys thrown in, which this M Sport Pro spec pretty much is, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. It's still really expensive compared to some of its rivals that have all the toys thrown in anyway. And so it has to be really blooming good in a lot of areas to justify that price tag. Well, it is still a BMW at the end of the day, so you expect its driving manners to be really good. So why don't we take it out on the road and start with that? Something that's quite interesting about the iX3 is you can only get it in rear wheel drive. You can get the iX1 in all-wheel drive with dual motors. Um, I reviewed that recently, it's on my channel, I'll leave a link at the end of this video. But most EVs, particularly premium ones as well, offer an all-wheel drive alternative and you're not getting one here. It's rear-wheel drive, motor on the back axle only and that is quite rare and limiting. Zero to 60 in 6.8 seconds, which is pretty good actually, really. Um, and 400 newton meters of torque, which is roughly the same as what you get out of a two liter diesel. But it does have 286 brake horsepower. And that's where you know there is still a difference between this and a two liter diesel. But because I've been so used to driving all wheel drive electric cars, this still feels remarkably slow when it's really not. So Hans Zimmer did this deal with BMW where he created these like symphony notes that made the car sound like you're going to warp speed when you're going fast. I don't think this car's got it. The iX1 I drove did, or I was a passenger in at least, watch the video to find out what I mean by that. Yeah, that one had it and it was like really fancy orchestra sounds when you accelerated. But in this car, I don't think it's got that because it's a pack or you, you can download it, but it still makes a noise when you hit the throttle and I'm not a big fan of synthetic sounds in cars, but I have to say I quite like this one. I think my kids would love it too. It does make the car feel like it's going a bit faster than it is. And also, there's something a bit more engaging about hearing a noise when you accelerate. When a car's totally silent, it feels like it dulls the experience of how fast you're going a little bit. And my Tesla Model 3 is a bit like that. You put your foot down, you're going super fast, but you don't hear anything. And so it lacks that little bit of engagement. And I think you get that with this. I mean, it's really not that fast an EV, but the fact is because it's an EV, just based on that alone, you've got that instant torque when you put your foot down. And so it feels like you get the most out of the performance it's actually got. Whereas with a diesel or something, you're still gonna have that potential turbo lag or the gears changing. And it's always just gonna feel just that little bit slower to get going and that quick overtaking maneuver. Whereas with this, you're good to go every time. But the suspension's quite firm and this one's got adaptive M Sport suspension as well and yeah I still think it's a little bit fidgety. I've never been in an EV yet where I thought the suspension was like really pillowy soft. I think that's just something that's quite hard to do in EVs because they're so heavy but it's all right and it's good that you can actually change the settings as well. You can also change the steering settings and in sport mode it's definitely stiffer. It's still not amazing. The Tesla Model Y steering is definitely better but it's pretty good and a good enough anyway that when you're starting to take corners a bit faster you do feel a little bit more engagement but it's not the best the handling's not bad in fact as far as evs go that i've driven it's one of the best but like every other ev i've been in i just don't really feel encouraged to actually throw it into bends they're just so heavy you know it stays pretty flat in the corners yes but 
it just feels like you're transferring so much weight and there's no all-wheel drive giving you extra grip and I just don't really feel that inspired with confidence to do it. So you can go around corners fast enough but I wouldn't really encourage you to go pushing the envelope too much. Just save your thrills for a straight line where technically you're not going to get that many of them either in this car. <laughs> Visibility is good though. I would like to see a frameless interior mirror like you get in the iX1, but you get decent sized wing mirrors, good visibility at the back, no big blind spots really to worry about. So, overall, job done. I'm really impressed with how refined this car is. It's really quiet in here, way more so than in my Tesla Model 3. Uh, and it's just, oh, it's lovely. And yeah, you know that BMW are putting a lot of their budget into the quality of things like that. And it really is good. It's so quiet. There's not a lot of road noise. And at higher speeds, you still don't really hear anything. I can hear myself talk really well. And if you have the amazing upgraded Harman Kardon sound system, which this car does have, with that level of acoustics, you've got a really great sound stage there. And I think that is is just fantastic. So this has got a official range of 290 miles, which is from an 80 kilowatt hour battery. Roughly the same as most EVs, to be honest. Um, hate to say it, Tesla Model Y again, slightly has it beat, uh, but it's better than the Mercedes EQC, although that's due to get refreshed pretty soon, so that'll probably be better but than it, it was before. But yeah, it's a decent enough battery, and the chances are you've a charge point at home. If you don't, don't get an EV in the first place, I would say, unless you can charge at work maybe, but other than that, if you are going to be doing a lot of long journeys, then the supercharger network that Tesla has can matter, but you still get access to a few of those with your BMW. Not all of them, but some of them. And so you want to plan your route pretty carefully, but you might still get by. Something about these leather seats though is they hug you in really well, though you can modify how much they do that. Classic BMW trait. And I do like to have them hugging me, but they do make your back sweat a little bit in days like this and they're not ventilated so that's not ideal the bmw ix1s came with alcantara which will definitely be better on a day like this something that is music to my ears though is um, to turn off the lane keep assist which is always on when you get in the car like any other modern car is just press this button on the dash and then quickly tap the touchscreen put all your safety systems off boom done and it's a really responsive touchscreen so it's just a tap and you're done uh, although i just accidentally did the gesture control there and it tried to turn up the volume don't like that but yeah really like that that's quite easy to switch off i hate the fact you've got to switch it off at all but the fact that it's quite easy to do that is welcome i think i may be officially lost i'm just driving around here and i've just all of a sudden realized talking on the camera i've maybe missed a turn somewhere and i'm just kind of driving about going where the hell am i Thankfully, the sat-nav is very easy to use and because it's such a responsive touchscreen, when you're typing in a postcode and stuff, it's just so easy to do. So I'm really relieved to have that because when you're somebody like me who's got the worst sense of direction ever, having a nice, easy-to-use sat-nav really matters. Something this car is doing that's really annoying me is every time I go over the speed limit, it's flashing in the infotainment display and it's beeping constantly. And I've switched this off in the infotainment system and it was really quite difficult to do. And I'm hoping there's an easier way to do that and that you can just switch it off permanently. Uh, but every time I've got back in the car, it's been back on again. So I'm either doing something wrong or that's a feature that's always on. And if that's the case, that's even more annoying than lane keep assist coming on every time I get in the car. Please somebody tell me that I've got this wrong and that can be switched off because that is ridiculous. Compared to its internal combustion engine brothers and sisters in the X3, I don't think there's a huge amount of differences other than the obvious ones like there's no gearbox and stuff. It's definitely probably not as light on its feet as you'd expect, but I still feel like I'm in a BMW, you know? It doesn't feel like a really futuristic EV. It feels fairly similar to the old X3 in quite a lot of ways, and I think that's a good thing. So before I show you the boot of the iX3, it's important to note it does have a high-res rear-view camera, but uh, it's exposed all the time, unlike in a Mercedes EQC. It doesn't tuck away underneath the badge, and there's no wash system for it. So you'll be cleaning that quite a lot, which is not ideal, but it is a smaller boot than in the internal combustion engine version of this car by 40 litres with the seats up, but you are getting 510 litres still, which isn't too bad. And it's a really square shape. It feels like you get quite a lot of stuff in there. I don't think that looks a lot smaller, to be honest, in the real world compared to the diesel one I drove. And with the seats down, you've got 1,560 litres and the seat split 40-20-40, which is really handy as well. You've also got a tie down point and netted area. And well, the batteries have to go somewhere, so they are under the floor but you do have a bit of space for your cables which is a real relief because i hate it when they don't give you that 
And yeah, it's a flat load bay as well, so you can get things in nice and easy. Overall, I think this will do most families, and it's roughly about the same size as most of its rivals. But something it doesn't have that a lot of its rivals do, and certainly cars that are built from the ground up as EVs always do, and I hate to say it, but the Tesla Model Y, that does it really well. Really good at packaging that car for space, but this isn't the internal combustion engine version of this car, so there's no engine in there. There's not even a motor in the front here because it's just rear wheel drive. So what's in here? Very little. That must be a bit of empty space. So it feels a little bit lazy from BMW that they've not tried to make a frunk out of this, and that's a shame. Pretty impressed with the back seats in this car. It feels reasonably wide in the back, and I don't think the middle passenger is going to feel shortchanged because this middle seat isn't like majorly raised up and really uncomfortable. Not much of a transmission tunnel either, so three sets of legs won't be too bad. So yeah, three people back here should be all right. Knee room's pretty good, toe room's really good, and you can't recline the seats though, so you can't fully spread out, but yeah, it's not too bad. Over six foot, head's gonna be hitting off this side bit, but you could lean in and you'll have a bit more space there. But um, yeah, I love this pan roof though. It does go fairly far back, so a lot of lights coming into the cabin. Elbow point in the door's really soft and squidgy. Not quite as much so in this one, but still pretty good. And I like the fact that the cup holders aren't in it, so your elbow's not going into it. And then you can lift it up and there's a nice felt line bit for some stuff. Shame they couldn't have put that into the doors, although they are massive, so you'll get really good ball sizes in there. You've also got cup holders here, which are nice. They've got teeth and everything, less faffy than in a Mercedes EQC. You've got Isofix there are two seats, really easy to get to. And you've also got two USB-Cs in the middle and your own climate control in the back, so that's really good. Overall, I think this is excellent. The thing that's really jumping out at me with this car is the interior is just wow. And it feels really techy and modern, but it also feels a little bit like the sweet spot for BMW. And I don't know if it was ever gonna get better than this because it's still giving me old like BMW F30 vibes, like my old three series in terms of, well, you've got a rotary controller for starters, but you've also got this nice big infotainment that's right in your eye line and loads of buttons and a really nice steering wheel and there's a lot of things to really like here in terms of how they've laid this out. It still feels really driver centric because infotainment faces the driver and yeah there's just plenty of buttons but not too many buttons. Every which way you want to control this you can do it. You've got voice control that works, you've got gesture control which is a pain in the neck and I wish yeah I don't really have any need for that but you've got shortcut buttons, all sorts of stuff. It's great. So that's really good and this iDrive 7 yeah, that then gets replaced by the iDrive 8, which you see in the BMW iX1, which I've also reviewed. Check that out on my channel as well. And that's got the curved screen, and that's really fancy looking, but I think it's a step backwards, to be honest, mainly because the rotary control is gone. So if you're somebody who's a BMW fanboy and's always loved the rotary controller, this is really about the last chance saloon for it. But quality-wise, it's really top-notch in here. Everything is solid, soft, good quality materials. I love the steering wheel and it's got that lovely BMW girthy thickness, but it doesn't feel quite as soft and tactile in the hands as I remember other BMWs being. I think the X3, the two litre diesel I reviewed was a slightly nicer steering wheel to hold. So I wonder if they've cheaped out a little bit subtly there, but it's still a good steering wheel. It's still better than most on the market. Um, and the door close, yeah, pretty solid as well. Not the best I've ever heard. Like the Audi's is probably a little bit better, but that is still a good door close and nothing moves. Buttons are nicely damped. Everything about the interior of this feels like it's built to last. And the driving position is really good. But these seats, they're all right, but they are quite firm, just like in the X3 2 liter diesel I drove. I just think they could be a little bit softer and squidgier. And so over long journeys, would that bother me? I'm not sure, but I would be a bit concerned that I would be a bit like, oh, this is not that comfortable because they're just not that soft. BMW seats are always pretty firm and I'm not a big fan of that. Much prefer the old school Volvo seats in a car. Just give me those in any other car. I'll be happy forever. But the range of adjustment is great and they look good. I mean, the owner of this car has a wee boy, so um, it's a bold strategy going with the cream leather when you've got young kids, but it does look really nice and it really finishes off this car quite nicely. Now let's talk cubbies because I love my cubbies and they're pretty good in this car. You've got a big central bin here with a USB port and a wee light. And then you got two cup holders at the front here, which have teeth on them, which I don't think the iX1s had actually, so they may be cheaped out there. But yeah, put your cup in, it's really nice angle to put your drink into your mouth and back. And they're deep, but you can also get an absolute behemoth of a bottle like this in there, and they don't actually obscure the buttons even then, which used to happen in a lot of BMWs, so that's good. The door bins are massive, you got a big bottle in there as well, loads of stuff, but they're not felt lined, so stuff could rattle about. The glove box is felt lined, but it's not very big, and yeah, why couldn't they put the felt lining in the doors as well? 
no sunglasses holder, but you've got a charge pad at the front there for your big phone. My phone's massive and it fits in there fine. So for the most part, really good. But on this infotainment system, I just think it's fantastic. It's so responsive. Like I don't think I've ever used a touchscreen that I thought was better at just tapping a button delicately and responding to my touch. Like the Tesla's screen gets a lot of rave reviews and it is a good screen, but I still find sometimes I have to press a couple of times to get it to do what I want or hold the side of it and use my thumb. And I find that really annoying. This car, swipey, swipey, scrolly, scrolly, boom, 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 absolutely brilliant. And it's just, yeah, tap, tap, tap. So responsive, it's absolutely brilliant. It takes a little bit of time to get used to it because there's a lot of ways to use it. But once you figure it out, it's absolutely excellent. And you've got wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto as well. That is fantastic. So it really has all bases covered. And then you do have your voice control, which actually works as well. And it's so bright and vibrant. And this cockpit's the same. It's all customizable as well. Everything looks just so techy and modern, but you've still got shortcut buttons and everything for your uh, heating controls and stuff like that. It's got all bases covered. It's just the best controlled system I think I've ever seen in a car. And when I say controlled, I'm, I'm centering mainly around the fact that this has a rotary controller still, which, yeah, I just can't believe they ever got rid of this. It's the most ridiculous decision ever from BMW. But this one has it. Let's enjoy it. You've got loads of little shortcut buttons down here beside it as well. Back options. You can write things in with your finger, which is actually really useful for writing in postcodes and stuff like that. Oh, it's so good. You've got a really dinky little gear stick button. I say gears, but you know, drive, reverse, etc. Park button. You've got your drive modes here as well. And oh, camera settings. It's just so simple, well laid out. Any old moron can figure this system out eventually. It's so good. And the steering wheel buttons are great as well. Really lovely quality damping as well. And you've got your adaptive cruise control. Yes, I did say adaptive cruise control. This car actually has it, which is amazing. I mean, how many times I've been in a BMW that's had that? I don't think ever. So that is fantastic. And then the right side of the steering wheel, yeah, your volume and your, your telephone and your vo voice control as well. So great. And then you've got heat steering wheel as well. So it just feels like it's got all bases covered. And in case you're wondering why there's so much traffic going past this car while I'm filming it and could I not have found a quieter location? I did originally have a quieter location, uh, but I had to reshoot part of the video because I had some technical issues and I've not been able to go back to that location to finish the video because um, I'm running low on range. And also uh, the insurance runs out in the car soon. So I had to literally pull up at the waterfront in Carnoustie and do the rest of the video here. So I've got a really fantastic view, but you don't. So this car only comes in M Sport and then you can add the Pro Pack. So they've gone really basic with the specs on this. There's none of this fancy loads of packs and options. And there's only one powertrain as well. It's really simplified with this car. I'm really surprised quite how simplified it is. But just so you know, the entry level... M Sport comes with the 12.3 inch digital cluster and 12.3 inch infotainment. You've got keyless entry as well, wireless phone charging, electrically adjustable leather seats, adaptive suspension, and a panoramic sunroof. <laughs> when have you ever got a panoramic sunroof in a BMW as standard? Then if you go for the Pro Spec, you get the Harman Kardon upgrade sound system, which sounds fantastic. A head up display and this amount of stuff that's in the head up display it's almost like you've got like a full screen projector in your windscreen. There's so much information there. It's really, really good. As long as you're not wearing polarized sunglasses. And you've also got automatic parking system. Well, I don't really care about that, but there's not many things you're missing. And you've also got adaptive cruise control. So like there's a really a very little gap between this and what you would get from the likes of a Tesla Model Y. And I think that is so important here because to compete with cars like that, which are cheaper on paper as well, you're going to have to throw in a lot of toys. And I think BMW finally got the memo with that. And so I do feel a little bit spoiled in here. It's also got adaptive LED headlights as standard. BMW never used to give you stuff like that. You can upgrade to the laser lights, which you don't need because they're not really that much better, but you've still got the ability to dance your beams around oncoming traffic. I've probably just turned on the gesture control there. So that's a fantastic feature to have at night. One of my favorite features in a car. So if you add that to the adaptive cruise control, the upgraded sound system, the electric seats with lumbar support, a pan roof, all of my favorite toys in a car this has got. So I am wanting for Nout. But about the price, this car starts at 65 grand. And if you go for the Pro Pack, it's about 68 and change, which is not a huge gap, actually. So I would probably go for that. Chances are, if you can afford a 65 grand car, you can afford a 68 grand car. So just get that one, have all the toys. But 
compared to some of its rivals, particularly the Mercedes EQC for stars. If you add on all the same kit on that one, it's more than that. But if you go for a Kia EV6 or a Hyundai Ioniq 5, they'll have all the toys as well. It'll be much cheaper. But that's the key thing. The quality of the toys in this car are absolutely top notch. This infotainment system is about as good as it gets. The quality in terms of the build, the materials, the fact you've still got adaptive cruise control that will work. I haven't tried it out, but it will work. I'm sure of it. An amazing sound system, the headlights, everything will be reliable, built to last and just feel like the best of the best, refined and brilliant. So if you can't afford a BMW, this is definitely a really good one to think about if you also don't need all wheel drive, otherwise you're stuffed. And in my case, that would be a deal breaker for where I live. I couldn't be arsed putting on winter tires, so I would just get a different car purely based on that. But outside of that, this is a really great package. And I really think if you're looking for a premium mid-size SUV that's electric, definitely take a look at this. Anyway guys, those are my thoughts. I would love to know yours, so please do leave me a comment below. And if you enjoyed the video, please do give it a like, share it, subscribe, all that good stuff. Helps me out massively, costs you nothing. Anyway, thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you in the next one.